Welcome to this lesson in which we will explore a simple structure project. This video lecture presents a holistic look at a simple structure using application. Non-structure solutions, parallel arrays, will be discussed, followed by an exploration of the development and implementation of the project. All right, so now we've done both sides of the equation, a read uh, uh, file reader and a file writer, and we've done a little bit of processing and editing um, in between. Okay. All right, so let's uh, put this one away, and let's take a look at the other lesson of the week, which is structures. And structures are cool because up until now, we have only been able to use arrays with the data types that Visual Studio has provided for us. And yet we see there's all these really cool, this whole world of objects that um, you know, have so much more power and so much more flexibility. And it's been kind of a headache because up until now, if we needed to store a string attribute, let's say a person's name, and a numerical attribute, how many, uh, we did one exercise, how many cars did they sell, all right? If we wanted to store those two, we had to use two arrays, and those arrays had to be kept parallel. And that means that if there were five elements in the number of names, then there ought to be five totals for the, the, the number of cars each salesperson sold. And if we ever got them out of order in one of the arrays, if we change one of the arrays but not the other, oh my goodness, um, we would never be able to figure it out. That would be kind of a mess. So there is a price to be paid in terms of good data design if we separate data elements into totally dissociated structures. So parallel arrays, convenient as they are, as fast as they are, aren't always the best thing to work with. And so what do we need? We need a way to create our own data type which contains multiple pockets. I need a pocket for strings for the, the, the salesperson name, and I need a pocket for other strings or a pocket for uh, integers or a pocket for uh, you know double precision numbers so that I can keep them associated. And indeed, we are now finding out tonight that we are co-equal with the gods as good as Bill Gates and the, the best of programmers out there. Um, yeah, which I don't know that I'd say that Bill Gates is the best of, good businessman, but I'm not sure he's the best programmer out there. Um, yeah, but probably better than me, so I can't th throw stones. Um, uh, but we can do everything that the Visual Studio team did in providing us with the Visual Studio tool itself because we can create objects, we can design objects, we can create um, structures and structures are in fact a very simple object. They're simple in that they don't have a lot of additional We don't design the new methods or the new properties for them They become an aggregate of the methods and the properties of the strings and integers and, and doubles and other data types that we um, you know, Use to construct them, but they're still darn handy. So let's take a look at this and this is kind of a fun application So I have decided Oh, someone's joined us. Welcome. Let's see, who's here? Nope, maybe Min just signed off. Okay, so, up oh, Min's back. So I- Yeah, still here. <laughs> okay, welcome. So um, I've uh, uh, designed a little bit of, uh, sort of with a Hogwarts uh, preoccupation tonight for some reason, or this week, um, uh, I put up our sorting hat in a picture box, and I'm using that as a button. So when you uh, fire the clicker event on the um, sorting hat, he's going to go down an array. Now, when I first wrote this, if I did it with parallel arrays, um, he would have to go and, and look at the element in the house array and figure out what house, and then he would go, so if he's at element number three, he would then go over to element number three in the names array and get uh, that, you know, whoever three is, let's see, uh, Harry Potter, uh, uh, Luna Lovegood, Hufflepuff, oh, must be Cedric Diggory, right? So, oh, three, that would be the fourth. So it'd be Draco Malfoy, zero, one, two, three. So uh, element three would be Draco Malfoy. He would have to go get that and drop it into Slytherin. And we could do it that way, but again, we've separated the data um, that really is intrinsically um, 
interrelated or associated. And so it's much better if we could create a data structure that keeps for each record what is the house the person belongs to and what is their first name and what is their last name? So in this case, it'll be three strings. We could easily have used uh, mixed data types. And that's the neat thing because up until now, we said, well, arrays can only hold elements of the same data type. Professor Beck, now you're telling us that you're going to store two different data types. Uh, 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 I'm gonna declare a new data type. It's gonna be a structure. It's gonna be a structure of type student. And it's a, a student is a compound structure that is um, further defined by elemental sub data types. Okay, so I haven't broken the rule. I'm still using an array of one data type, student, but student has, now we're into object notation. It has a dot house, a dot F name for a first name and a dot L name for last name. So let's go ahead and see how this code works. I'm gonna hit, I clicked on the form, I'm gonna hit F7 to bring up the, uh, uh, editor and uh, let's see so I see that in my form class at the module level I've declared the structure and by declaring it here at the module level that means everything within that that module all of the subroutines and functions uh, will be able to use it the scope makes it accessible okay and let's read this. This is one of the very first things you read if you're a maintenance programmer coming into a new job is you go and read the, at the heading, you start looking at all the data structures and learn how they work. And so I find out that there is a structure named student and a student has a dot house, which is a string and a dot F name, which is a string and a dot L name, which is a string. Okay. And so there's our um, public uh, class form and our structure declaration. The other thing that we're declaring at a module level um, is a uh, one-dimensional array, Hogwarts, with th uh, four elements, 0, 1, 2, 3, as student. So um, we're going to create this array of student. So student is further defined as these three data type elements, but we've now made them into a single data type that is a, a single but compound data, data type and, to, and stored them in the Hogwarts array, okay? Well, we haven't yet stored them in the Hogwarts array and that we're going to do on the form load. So when the form initially loads, just like walking any other array, only you notice that I use the same element three times instead of having three parallel arrays, one, one array for first names, one array for last names, one array for house, this stores into element zero of the student record in Hogwarts. So element zero dot house is Gryffindor, element zero dot first name is Harry, and element zero dot last name is Potter. Similarly, when I get down to the fourth item, element three, house is Slytherin, F name is Draco, and L name is Malfoy. And so if I were to set a breakpoint right here and run this, so the form loads to and runs to the break. And so if I were to come down here and then take a look, what's the name of our array again? The name of our array is Hogwarts. So if I come here and add Hogwarts to the array, or to the uh, watch, watch list, okay? And then if I expand that out, indeed I can see that there are zero, one, two, three, there are four elements in it. And if I want to further decompose this, if I come down to the number two element, F name is Cedric, House is Hufflepuff, and L name is Diggory. Very cool, very, very convenient, and, and much uh, easier and more efficient in many ways than having three separate um, uh, arrays that I have to keep aligned and parallel and you know, make sure they always all have the same number of entries and whatnot. Now that I have one entry that has both, or all three, the house, first name, and last name, I don't have to worry about orphaning or having a short array, because if I ever have a short array, if one of the three arrays is short and then I come and add more data, I will never know at what point it got foreshortened. So I've eliminated that possibility, 
right? So nice and neat. All right, so let's get rid of our breakpoint and in the run and see how the rest of this goes. Okay, so everything else, the magic is on the picture box and it's the click event. So when you click on the, the, the picture box, the first thing I do, because you might wanna click on the, the, the picture box multiple times, is I make sure that the Gryffindor text box text is empty and the Ravenclaw and the Hufflepuff and the Slytherin text boxes are all empty. Um, otherwise, I'd end up with multiple cut. Might be interesting. Uh, we'll do that in a minute. We'll, we'll comment this code out to see what happens if we hit the read button multiple times because I made those multi-line uh, text boxes. And then I'm using uh, a for next loop for i equals integer zero to three, so counter. Um, improvements that are possible here. Well, I hate to see hard-coded ranges. It would be smarter for me to go get the lower bounds and the upper bounds of the array. The other thing that I could do is I could use a for each. Now, for each actually has some interesting implications as to how you declare the data types if you are working with an array of structures. And rather than get really confusing, I didn't do it that way. Um, if you are up for a challenge, um, this would be a great thing. If you have all your other work done and you've already studied for the exam or you've taken the exam, I think we have an exam due Tuesday, um, then, uh, um, then, then explore replacing this with a for each. But it gets a little bit hairy um, compared to what we've been, been doing. So uh, you're invited to explore that as an extra um, exercise. And what we're doing here is we're walking an if then else if structure and we're saying, hey, if the house says Gryffindor, for whatever student I'm looking at, then drop him in Gryffindor. And, and if not, drop him or her in Ravenclaw. And if not, drop him or her in Hufflepuff. And if I've checked all those, then the only thing left is uh, um, Slytherin. So drop them in Slytherin. And now we have our sorting hat has done its job. So um, again, let's watch that work. And so we click on the sorting hat, and there we go. So it doesn't, it just discards the word Gryffindor out of the structure because I have a label for, for Gryffindor and Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff and Slytherin over the text box and it just sorts each student in there um, automagically as it were. And uh, I can click on it again and again and again and it looks like it's not doing anything. What it's actually doing is clearing those text boxes and writing them back in again. And I think we can prove that here if we had come up and forgotten to clear those text boxes each time and we run that at it once and again and again and again and, and I didn't put in line breaks, right? And those are just multi-line text boxes, they're not list boxes. And so we get kind of a mess if we do that. Not kind of funny. All right. Well, that's it. So there's our uh, our structures and uh, the use and benefit of uh, using the structures. And yeah, let's go ahead and clean that up. Turn it back to normal operation. And boom. So there we are. Questions? Uh, so structures just kind of help your code look cleaner, right? Yeah, um, a structure is a record. And these are really simple structures. But think about if you are in a business, you could have, um, let's say you were actually running a school. One record for Harry Potter would have his date of birth, his social security number, um, his emergency contact information, his mother's address, his father's address, his immunization record, um, maybe his prior school transcripts. Oh my gosh, there could be hundreds of these attributes. So a structure can get quite complex. And now you can imagine as ugly as that code might be, a structure would still be far preferable to um, what if you had to use parallel arrays and you had 75 different attributes on the form? Mm. Oh my gosh, can you imagine trying to keep your code straight with, as opposed to you declare the structure and then any 
programmer, so the next maintenance program, programmer who comes in and has to maintain your code, goes in and looks at the structure, and we can annotate this with all kinds of comments. As a matter of fact, think about this for a second, man. An address is a fairly complex object, isn't it? It has a street address, a zip code, um, you know, there, there are other elements to it, an apartment number. Could we create a structure just for the address? And then could we later create a structure for the student that includes the student's first and last name, but also includes other structures, such as the address, such as a structure for the student's immunization record? This is really powerful because now we can take and build little building blocks, little particles, and think about what you have to do currently in your code. Right now, you have to build all of your code one Lego at a time. What if I could give you a set of Legos that you could, you know, let's say you're going to build, you ever, you ever see a gas station? Gas stations have usually four pumps on an island, right? Or two mm -hmm. pumps on an island, they're a really small one, and you may have, let's say you have two pumps on an island, and you have four islands under a canopy, and you have two canopies. So two times four times two is 16 pumps in, in that gas station. Okay, if you had to build that gas station Lego by Lego, each gas pump has to be built separately. Or you have a choice as a sort of a programmer who builds gas stations, you could have a Lego that's a whole four pump canopy. How much quicker could you build that gas station? Way quicker. So the, the implication of a structure is that a structure can contain other structures that can contain other structures. So mm -hmm. we can take elemental units, making it very, if we, if we build small units to begin with, they're very easy to code, they're very easy to debug. And we make all the programs that we need to work with that individual, you know, sort of primitive structure. But then we build bigger structures. It doesn't matter how big the structure, we can always go back and hand that primitive element to the code that can read the pump, um, uh, volume on pump number one and, and multiply that by the price of unleaded gas and give us a total. Um, and now we have something code that, that can really work over a large um, number of objects really effectively without our having to um, keep track of all the complexities in our head. I had a wonderful um, mentor in my graduate program, uh, Dr. Muhammad Ayati, and Dr. Ayati said, Beck, complexity is merely the aggregation of simplicity. And what he was telling me is that people don't solve complex problems well. People solve simple problems well. But the one thing that is almost magical, magical about people is as good as we are, we are at creating complexity, we can also break complexity into smaller pieces and it becomes simpler. And so when you're faced with a complex problem, break it down and break it down again and break it down again until you have a very simple problem, then write a piece of code to fix it, to, to address that problem. Then, having solved the little problems, roll all your code that solves all the little problems together, and now you have a big program that can do powerful things for thousands or tens of thousands of users at the same time at remarkable speeds. This is the, the magic of, of uh, modular computing. This will become a lot um, clearer and more obvious when we start adding to structures and we start um, going beyond structures and building okay. objects. A structure itself, as I said, uh, doesn't have a lot of, of methods to it. But let's say that we were to start extending this idea of I have, I have a structure named student and it goes into an array called Hogwarts. But what if beyond an array, what if we made that, um, that Hogwarts object truly an object and we started adding code that was encapsulated with it that could do things such as sorting for us and maybe it could sort alphabetically by last name or maybe it could sort by house or maybe it could filter by house um, all of that code could go into so if I said Hogwarts dot filter so if I created this as, an, as a real complex object someday I might be able to say you know something like Hogwarts dot filter let's make it this way dot filter and I say Slytherin 
And this would give me a subset, an array that's, or a list, a vector, that's only the students that are in Slytherin. That would be a really powerful thing to be able to do. Right now, if I want to do that, I have to walk the whole array and print or output only those um, five, first names and last names that have a dot house of equal to, to Slytherin. So that's where we're headed with this, and it gets really exciting um, <laughs> always. The next class, when you start doing real object-oriented programming with this stuff, um, but even even before we get there, um, you know, the ability to use um, groups of Legos, sort of macro Legos, um, to save our time in building things, be, it starts to become very, very powerful. And it's a little bit hard to see when we're talking about little tiny structures that we use for learning that only contain three um, elements in them. But uh, very quickly, um, it starts to be, especially once you've worked with them a little bit, uh, it starts to become very clear that these are very powerful. Um, they become much more intuitive and self-documenting. And that's one of our biggest problems in reusing code and using and maintaining code effectively is that um, you know, large programs are often hard to keep in your head and understand, whereas small programs built from um, compound or rich structures or objects um, are easy to understand, they're easy to debug, it's easy to modify them or find uh, the pieces that you need, and it is easier to reuse the code that you have, have built. And one of the things you will find in your career as a programmer is you develop sort of your own toolbox, your own library of code that you have uh, worked with, you created, um, and uh, uh, the more you work with it, um, the more powerful um, you become, and, and you will have certainly your elemental pool, uh, tools all, always, your strings, your integers, your floats and doubles, but you will also start to work with, particularly if you're working in one particular company on one particular um, area of computing. Uh, so let's say you were working for a large law firm and you're doing document management where they do a lot of, of imaging and OCR conversion uh, of um, you know, uh, law cases and, and filing them and, and cross-referencing them and keeping them. Um, you can see how these kind of structures and whatnot, if you've been working there for a few years, you're going to have some wonderful tools in your tool chest to build almost any kind of application that has to do with uh, manipulating, uh, you know, legal files. Um, and, and you'll see that that's, that's the case. In fact, this is so true that um, if you go to, um, you probably never heard of some of the specialty stores that are out there on the, the web, like Programmer's Paradise. Um, you can buy libraries that other programmers have put together uh, and sell uh, to make um, certain tasks easier. Um, and, uh, uh, but uh, certainly you, you probably started to work with different uh, code repositories um, out there. And if not, you will soon in your programming future, there are, um, uh, you know, you can you can use get and uh, um, and get uh, um, you know, entire libraries that people have written to uh, do tasks that programmers do frequently. Oftentimes, they're shared freely. Um, otherwise, uh, the really powerful and, and valuable ones uh, are available, um, you know, for license or purchase. It becomes actually these days it's part of your portfolio. So what have, what have, what have you built and what have you shared? Um, so that's that's one of the things is, is if you go down the software engineering direction now this is a CIS class um, we are focused primarily on programming and uh, uh, applying computer science for business um, if you want to go hardcore software engineer great career one of the top paying uh, careers uh, in the nation right now uh, but uh, if that's if, if you've gotten excited about that in this class and feel that you really have the talent and this is what you really love to do you might want to take a look at it is CIS you know I don't want to send anybody out of the CIS major I mean that's 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 what I do and that's how I've made my living but you should look at the the uh, the CS major as well you know uh, the way it in different colleges uh, divvy it up differently but in Santa Barbara City College uh, the CIS department has um, the operations, um, help desk uh, training, uh, system administration training, um, and all the database, relational database stuff is in the CIS department. If you're in, in, interested in hardcore computer science theory, if you're interested in 
software engineering and programming in, in other languages than uh, uh, Visual Basic, um, which is still used widely in business, but less so in commercial development. Uh, you want to learn C++, C++, uh, C Sharp, uh, Java, uh, PHP, Python, some of the other uh, programming languages that are in vogue right now, then you um, ought to take a look at what the offerings are um, in the computer science department as well. Hmm. So that's, that's how the division of labor is here. All right, anything else? I didn't else? realize programming. I didn't realize programming was different from software engineering. I thought it was same thing, really. <laughs> um, well, you know what, in, in a sense it is. If you have a, if a software engineering project can be done by one engineer, he's a programmer, she's a programmer. Mm -hmm. um, software engineering, um, and, and you'll need to look, there are different definitions out there, and I'm not sure that there's one that, that is the gold standard. But in general, software engineering is done in teams. Um, sometimes it's teams of two, but often there are many teams of two if they're doing what they call agile or extreme uh, programming where you use many small teams developing um, different parts of a system um, independently. And of course, they all work from a single software repository version control system and set of des overriding design documents so that everything you build you know, is, is built with the, you know, no, nobody builds Legos that have holes that are different size or different shape because otherwise your Legos don't snap together, right? So there are certain standards that you have a lot of small teams developing on. And when you do this um, with modern programming tools, you can have several teams and you could be turning out, um, you know, a good programmer turns out uh, man, a, a good solid 800 lines of code a day, right? If you've got several teams working on this, you know, you could be turning out 8,000 lines of code a day that are solid, you know, and don't have to be rewritten or, or eliminated. And you do a lot of sample code and test stuff and, and stub code that you later throw out because you're just using it to test with. So, you know, getting 800 net is, is uh, actually kind of tough. And it depends on the language. It depends on the experience of the programmer. But if you can get 10 teams that are moving you forward um, 8,000 lines a day, then in 10 days, you could have 80,000 lines of code. And in 100 days, you can have a really robust enterprise system. Um, and that is, um, you know, that has been sort of the, uh, the, the, the elusive goal, the, the myth of, of what we'd like to achieve is predictability in development and cost uh, management because oftentimes, I mean, you look how frequently software engineering runs into cost overruns. Look at all the games that, that have been a year late and three million or 30 million or $300 million um, over budget uh, and that kind of stuff. You realize that this is a, a challenging uh, field of endeavor, but we're getting better and better at it. Um, and also, software engineers generally are paid more. Um, programmers often work with less standard. They, it was, um, you know, a, an older time. You had one person, you know, cowboys out there uh, uh, or cowgirls, um, you know, uh, building things, you know, all by themselves and, and, and ignoring or not using a lot of, of standards. And we've gotten better and better and better over the years of that because, uh, you know, one of the the worst situations for new newbie programmers are almost always put in as um, maintenance programmers. We don't we don't let you you know run lead until you've got a, a few years under your belt or some experience unless you really are all that in a bag of chips. And so you come in doing maintenance, and if you come in and you look at code that was developed by a, a group, it's usually for all the fact that that there's a lot of variation in even with standards, there's variation in coding style. Um, there are consistency in naming conventions, and um, the, hopefully some of the libraries get reused. You don't find a lot of, of functions that are being duplicated. One person wrote it this way, another person wrote it that way. This one has this bug, that one has that bug. Oh my gosh, trying to clean that up as a maintenance programmer is is a real nightmare. Where uh, um, Whereas if there's a shop standard, a lot of people working on it, it actually tends to be better documented and more consistent then even if one single programmer wrote the whole thing, um, you know, because everybody has, has limits of vision. And when you have something like an agile or extreme um, team or, or RUP, uh, a, a rational unified 
process uh, development house. Uh, there are different methodologies to how you manage development teams, but when you have this, you tend to um, you know get um, rather than the average performance of all of those programmers, you get something closer to the optimal pr uh, performance of each of those programmers. At least if it's well done, at least that's the theory. Um, in my experience, that, that tends to be fairly true. Um, and so um, good standards and uh, good development methodology and several good type programming teams, you can produce um, uh, some really amazing code uh, very, very quickly and with high quality. And then, uh, you know, then, Quality control and testing is a whole other story. We often spend more in quality control and testing than we do on the initial development of the code that we're testing to begin with. Um, and, and that's because it's just that important. Um, you know, you're talking about uh, the software that's going to run the business, that's going to maintain uh, health industry systems, that's going to uh, maintain national security, that missile and guidance control, weapon systems, uh, all kinds of things. It's really, really important in many cases that the code be right and right the first time. So, um, you know, I, I worked for, uh, not as a, as a software developer, I worked in, as, in IT audit, another control function. Uh, for four years for Caltech and JPL, and uh, those people do software like nobody I know. And the reason is, you know, when some of their software fails, it's usually, you know, something like 186,000 miles back to the shop to fix it. So, so it really, really has to be enormously um, high quality and very flexible and, and very durable um, under a lot of, of different performance constraints. So. Neat stuff. That's a whole nother story, though. Other questions for me? Uh, no more questions. Okay, then I think we'll wrap it here. I think that we've picked um, the examples that should uh, 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 address most of the individual tasks that you'll need to uh, complete the five exercises uh, for week 12, as well as the assignment. And as always, uh, if you or anybody watching this recording um, has questions um, that weren't addressed here, uh, let me know. I'm more than happy to release some additional notes or, or add an additional um, uh, short video uh, to address questions and demonstrate uh, uh, how to attack any of the, the problems that you need uh, to, to solve in order to complete uh, the week's work. All right, so I'm going to end the recording here. This concludes the lesson.